Good to, good to be here. We're, we're going to start on a little journey through through the book of Job. And to help you with that and what, who on earth's Job, what's the book of Job all about, we've got a little video to help uh, you get up to speed with the person and the book of Job. Thanks, Kim. There are three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. The first, Proverbs, showed us that God is wise and just. Yeah, we learned that God has ordered the world so that it's fair. The righteous are rewarded, the wicked are punished. In other words, you get what you deserve. But then we meet Ecclesiastes who observes, well, people don't always get what they deserve. Uh, yeah, he said the world isn't always fair, that life is unpredictable and hard to comprehend, just like smoke. And this makes you wonder, okay, well, is God wise and just? Exactly. And so it's that question that is being explored in the final book of wisdom, Job. All right, let's dive in. So Job begins with a strange story that takes place up in the heavens, which are described something like a heavenly command center. So God is there with these angelic creatures called the sons of God, and they're all there reporting for duty. And God points out this guy Job, his servant, showing how righteous and good he is. And then one of these angelic creatures approaches. He's referred to in Hebrew as the Satan. The Satan. Who is this? Well, this word is actually a title, which literally means the one who is opposed. So out of this whole crew, he is the one questioning how God is running the world. And he proposes that Job might not actually love God, that he's only a good person because God rewards him. If God were to take away all of the good things he gave to Job, then we would see his true colors. So he thinks Job is just working the system? That's exactly right. Maybe he's obeying just to get what he wants. So God agrees to this experiment and allows the Satan to inflict <laughs> something on Job. And Job loses everyone and everything that he cares about. It is devastating. And remember, he deserves none of this. God himself said so. The remarkable thing is that in the midst of all this suffering, Job still praises God. At least for chapters 1 and 2. But then in chapter 3, we find out how he's really feeling inside. He unleashes this poem that reveals his devastation. It's a long, elaborate curse on the day that he was born. After this, some of Job's friends come to visit him to offer their help. And all of them are like, Job, you must have done something horribly wrong to deserve this. After all, we know God is just, and we know the world is ordered by God's justice and fairness, so... You must be getting what you deserve. And for the next 34 chapters, the friends and Job go back and forth in very dense Hebrew poetry. His friends keep speculating about why God might have sent such suffering, and they even start making up lists of hypothetical sins that Job must have committed. But after each accusation, Job defends his innocence. And Job is innocent. He is. He's also on an emotional roller coaster. At some moments, he's very confident that God is still wise and just. Yeah, in other moments, he's doubting God's goodness. He even comes to accuse God of being reckless, unfair, and corrupt. So by the end of the dialogue, Job demands that God come and explain himself in person. And God does so. He comes in the form of a great storm cloud. Now, God doesn't give Job a direct answer. He doesn't tell Job about the conversation with the Satan. Yeah, he does something very different. He takes Job on a virtual tour of the universe. He shows Job how grand the world is, and he asks him if he's even capable of running it or understanding it just for a day. He shows Job how much detail there is in the world, things that we might see every day but really don't understand at all. But God does. He knows it all intimately. He pays attention to the beauty and operations of the universe in ways that we haven't even imagined and in places that we will never see. Then to conclude, God shows Job two wondrous beasts and brags about how great they are. Yeah, they are dangerous. I mean, they would kill you without even thinking about it. And God says they're not evil. 
they're actually a part of his good world. And then that's it. That's God's whole defense. It's kind of weird. I mean, what was this all about? It seemed to be this. From Job's point of view, it looks like God is not just. But God's perspective is infinitely bigger. He's dynamically interacting with a whole universe of complexity when he makes decisions. And this is what God calls his wisdom. So Job asking God to defend himself is actually kind of absurd. He couldn't comprehend this kind of complexity even if he wanted to. So where does this leave us? Well, it leaves Job in a place of humility. He never learned why he suffered. And yet, he's able to live in peace and in the fear of the Lord. But that's not where the book ends. Because after this, God restores to Job double everything he had lost. And this, again, is surprising. I mean, is this a reward? Is God saying, congratulations, Job, you passed this elaborate test? No. I mean, the whole book just made the point that Job losing everything was not a punishment. And so now getting it back isn't a reward. So why does he get it back? Well, apparently, God, in his wisdom, decided to give Job a gift. We don't know why. But what we do know is that Job is now the kind of person who, no matter what comes, good or bad, he can trust God's wisdom. And that's the book of Job and the end of our wisdom series. These biblical books of wisdom are amazing. Each one offers a unique perspective on the good life. And you need to hear all of them together as you learn to live with wisdom and in the fear of the Lord. There you go. There you go. I'll go home now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Hope you enjoy that little snapshot. Yes, uh, Mondays and mornings, 10 o'clock, Tuesday evenings. Uh, meet with John and or meet with Ron in the mornings. If you've never been part of the Bible study group, come enjoy the ride for the next six, six weeks as we look at Job. Uh, consider making that commitment. Hey, I'll do that for six weeks. You, As Ron said, you might even enjoy it. So 10 a.m. on a Monday here or Tuesday night at John's home at 7.30. So come. All, all welcome to do that. We look forward to sharing with you. Job's story is recorded for us. So we can live life knowing that we can trust in God. Living through those sad times, those unexpected losses, the joys, the highs, the dramas of life, but still trusting in God. The book of Job, I feel, is very relevant for our time. As we open up these pages over the next few weeks, I pray that we'll discover all that God wants to say to us. Let me bow in prayer. Father God, this morning, as we just take a couple of moments to introduce our new theme, may we hear from you. May we remember that you are there, God. At times there's confusion, at times there's hurt, at times there's sadness and disappointment. But God, you are there. And we trust in you. As we've sung and as we've proclaimed this morning, Lord, we trust in you, that you'll hold us firm. In Jesus' name. Amen. Job chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, up on the screen there for you. In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And as you heard there, Job's suffering seems to come out of nowhere and have no connection to his character or the person that he was. His story is recorded for us so that we might have some help in living through these interesting times of life as we hold on to God's goodness. Job had seven sons, three daughters, lots of sheep, lots of camels, oxen, servants. He was the greatest man in all the East. One of the greatest 
finest people. And he loses it all. In Job 1.8, God puts him on display. Hey, Satan, he says, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on the face of the earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. From 1 Job, verse 8. Have you considered this blameless man? And so Job is tested to the limits. All of this makes the coming trouble that much more devastating. The very fact that Job stuck out in such a noble way somehow made that trouble come and find him. Satan chooses him because of his standing with God. Not in spite of it, like so many of us would like to believe. The goodness of Job is a clear message that goodness is not enough to keep us from trouble. Job had it all. It was better than the average person in every way possible. Job had no idea of these conversations taking place between God and Satan. He was just simply living out his life as he always did. Then all of a sudden his world crumbles. The children are gone. The livestock are gone. Everything's gone. This small insight is a powerful truth. Before the pain and the arguments and ultimately the relief found in Job's story, we are able to catch a glimpse of God's supremacy. That God cares, that God is in control, that he hears our prayer, that he stands out of time and space and sees your life and my life. Even in our darkest times, we can have hope because he is God and he knows what is happening. Just as Job is covering from this shock and this loss, he contracts a terrible disease. It's Job chapter 2, verse 7 to 10, up there for you. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet, and that one died. <laughs> Hello. You can read along, why don't you? Yes. From the soles of his feet to the top of his head. Then Job took a piece of pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. Now people, isn't that a sad, pitiful sight? His wife, good on her. Thanks, Jamie. You would think you'd get a bit of encouragement from your wife, wouldn't you, Ben? Are well, you all too busy watching them or listening to me? Mm -hmm. That's good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Renee. So he's sitting there scraping his sores in the ashes, and his wife says to, it, says to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity, Job? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. He takes a piece of pottery and he's scraping at those sores and bursting them open so they might have a chance to heal and he's in pain and he's suffering and he's lamenting and, and sitting in ash and his wife goes, oh, are you going to curse God now, Job? No. no. In the book of Job, as we see over these next few weeks, there's financial loss, there's emotional loss, there's death, disease, victory, and abundance. Friends, God is good. He wants the very best for me and the very best for you. As he grants us freedom to exercise choice, good or bad. In all our decisions, good and bad alike, 
If they produced identical results, we would never be motivated to choose the good over evil. And so the suffering that we reap as a consequence of those foolish choices does not in fact reflect upon God's ability, but what we have chosen to do. Consider Paul's sacrifice from 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28. He was a godly man. He was God's servant. He was God's man. Faithful follower of Jesus, but suffered much. Are they servants of Christ? Am I out of my mind to talk like this? I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Wasn't once enough. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have laboured and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and, have gone, and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked, says Paul. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Clearly, there can be a divine plan in which goodness and suffering are compatible. By the time this interview with the Lord has been concluded, Job was completely devastated. He humbly confessed in Job 42 verse 2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose or plan of yours can be thwarted. God, I know it's your purpose and your plan. God has limitless, limitless power. God has wisdom and God has justice. And God is true. And God is right. And we hold on to that. We must learn to trust our Creator and not question His plan for humanity. One of the greatest values of this thrilling Old Testament document is found in its power to help us get a grip on our frailness, on our ailments, on our human condition at times. As we walk the roads of life, we learn to trust in God. We learn to be people of hope and faith and prayer. So come, come with me as we consider Job. God bless you. Amen.